When you were first introduced to the concept of sedimentary rocks, you were probably told that sedimentary rocks break down into sediment through weathering and erosion, and that sediment, in turn, undergoes a process of compaction and cementation to turn into layers of sedimentary rock. There is no denying that this is a hugely important part of the much bigger rock cycle, which describes the transformations of rock, sediment, and magma over time as they are recycled across our planet. However, this emphasis on lithogenous and particulate sediment makes it easy to overlook the fact that many sedimentary rocks do not consist of pieces of pre-existing rocks. Terrigenous rocks, like sandstone, siltstones, and conglomerates like this one, do consist of lithogenous sediment derived from weathering and erosion of sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic rocks. But carbonate rocks tend to form from biogenous sediment derived from the biomineralized bodies of once living organisms, as well as hydrogenous sediment derived from chemical reactions in water, which result in the precipitation of minerals. Not to mention, besides these carbonate rocks, there are various other types of sedimentary rocks that consist entirely of biogenous and hydrogenous sediment. Carbonate rocks are typically treated as their own separate category, so we'll save them for another day. The remainder are sometimes called biochemical rocks, but really this grouping is one of convenience, not reasoning. Some of the rocks are truly biochemical meaning that they only form as a consequence of chemical reactions caused by life. Others don't require the presence of life at all. They consist of hydrogenous sediment that forms as a result of natural chemical reactions under conditions devoid of organisms. They're simply chemical, not biochemical. And then finally, there are various types that can form biotically and abiotically. Life forms sometimes play key roles in the formation of these rocks, but they probably aren't essential. Now, before we explore the origins of these rocks, let's step back and think about how biogenous and hydrogenous sediment factor into the rock cycle because they do in a very big way. There's a tendency to want to focus on particulate sediment. And there's a misconception that when a rock is weathered, it only produces particles, as if every bit of the rock is somehow transformed into grains of sediment. This is not true. Most of the body of the rock may end up as particulate sediment, but weathering can also release elements and molecules like silica, calcium, iron, carbonate, phosphate, and various other things like chemicals that we might call nutrients or vitamins. These compounds are released by weathering which frees them from minerals through various processes of chemical dissolution. As a result, they become dissolved in water rather than being trapped inside particles. Once they are dissolved in water, they are free to precipitate in chemical reactions and become hydrogenous sediment. Indeed, they can even become minerals inside rocks again. Alternatively, organisms may incorporate these chemical compounds into their bodies through the chemical reactions involved in sustaining life. In which case, the molecules may be passed through the various lines of food chains and food webs from one organism to another. 
Some organisms may even use the molecules to produce mineralized shells, which may eventually become bioclasts in rocks like this limestone. In any case, these processes and reactions make up various circuits around our planet, which we call biochemical cycles. These biochemical cycles complement the rock cycle by emphasizing the complex relationships that exist between water, rock, air, and life, among other things. One of the most well-known, of course, is the carbon cycle which explains how carbon trapped in rocks finds its way into the atmosphere, out through organisms, and back into the crust of our planet. But there are also silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, and nitrogen cycles. Too many to review here. Suffice it to say that biogenous and hydrogenous sediment also form from weathering and erosion of rock. They just take a very indirect route to becoming particulate matter. So what are the origins of the various biochemical sedimentary rocks? Let's start with some of the seemingly easy ones. Coal and amber. Interestingly, both of these rocks come from plants. Plants are the building blocks of these rocks. Coal is a combustible black or brown sedimentary rock consisting mostly of carbonaceous material in the form of organic matter, long complex molecules of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. It is black because of its high concentration of this organic matter from plants. When a plant dies under ordinary conditions, it decomposes. Decomposition is caused by animals and fungi and various microscopic organisms like bacteria. These organisms use oxygen and other oxidants to break down the complex organic molecules of organic matter releasing simple molecules like carbon dioxide and water. Naturally, this process is why bones are often the only things that remain of human bodies not long after their death. The rest of the body consists of organic matter, which gets decomposed under most circumstances. Plants don't have hard mineral parts like bone. But if you look closely at coal, you'll find that it often contains many, many plant fossils. You can think of these plants as bioclasts within the coal. So how did these plants survive decomposition? The reason has to do with the depositional environments of coals, of course. The vast majority of coals on our planet formed in wet, waterlogged environments. These environments include some lakes, lagoons, and bogs. Some coals even form in marine environments from microscopic algae called plankton. That said, most coals are attributed to swamps that were home to numerous plants and animals that lived in the past. When a plant dies in this sort of environment, it may decompose completely, or it may get buried under water, sediment, and other plant debris. In these conditions, Plants accumulate faster than oxygen. As the plants are decomposed, the oxygen in the environment is depleted. Oxygen levels decrease over time until there is no oxygen present in the environment. At this point, we say that the environment has anaerobic conditions and anoxia. 
both of these terms mean that there is virtually no oxygen in the environment. Under these conditions, plants don't really decompose, they just accumulate. Layer after layer after layer of dead plant debris builds up over time. This wet, dead, and partially decomposed plant debris is called peat. After it is buried, peat will eventually undergo lithification and become the black organic matter rich rock that we call coal. Coal isn't simply organic matter. It usually contains some amount of lithogenous sediment like silt or mud. That sediment gets eroded and transported into the peat in the depositional environment. If there is a lot of terrigenous material, then the rock is more accurately described as a carbonaceous mud rock or a black shale. A rock is typically only considered a coal if two thirds of the mass is solid organic matter. The solid organic matter is called macerol, and there are various types of macerols which we're not going to worry about right now. Think of macerol though like a mineral. It's, it's a mineral made entirely of carbonaceous material. Because macerol has a low density, coal is deceptively light to the touch. It's not very heavy. And because macerol is combustible, coal can be burned as a fuel to release energy stored in the form of bonds between carbon and complex organic molecules. This is why coal is one of the biggest commodities in the energy industry. There's a whole sector of business dedicated to coal. The most desirable coals are generally 90% macerols. The rest of the rock consists of non-organic and non-combustible materials like fine grain lithogenous sediment, which is called ash. Let's move on now from coal to amber another sedimentary rock formed from plant material. Amber has a distinct look. It is usually yellow or orange and translucent and somewhat transparent. That said, it is often overlooked as a sedimentary rock. People forget about it. This isn't particularly surprising. Amber is somewhat uncommon and rare and it doesn't have much economic value. People mainly care about amber because it sometimes contains excellent fossils and it can be used as a gemstone to make jewelry. You've often heard that amber is fossilized tree sap, I would imagine. This is absolutely incorrect. Amber is actually hardened tree resin, not sap. Sap is essentially a sugar. Resin is more like a glue that plants produce to protect themselves and seal their damaged parts. Animals like this one got themselves caught in that resin glue before it hardened. The resin prevented any oxygen from reaching it, so it didn't decay and it ultimately became a fossil. Clearly, there is no doubt that coal and amber are biochemical rocks. They both contain very clear evidence of chemical reactions caused by life. But what about the others? Let's start with chert. Chert doesn't have any real economic value but it's extremely common. It comes in a variety of colors, but it's usually black or gray. Chert is a fine grain sedimentary rock made of silt sized interlocking crystals made of silica. The silica is typically present 
as the mineral quartz, which is one of the most common minerals in the crust. Because quartz is one of the hardest minerals on Earth, chert is extremely hard. It is the hardest sedimentary rock by far. You can also recognize chert from its sharp edges and conchoidal fractures. Conchoidal fractures are smoothly rounded and curving fractured surfaces. These fractures get their name because of their curved lines, which resemble the growth lines on the shells of things like conchs, a type of marine gastropod or snail. Chert can be found as beds and strata, but it is also commonly found as irregular beds called lenses, as well as round and ellipsoidal nodules surrounded by other types of sedimentary rock, like limestone. In any case, in order for chert to form, there needs to be a depositional environment with a lot of silica dissolved in water. If the concentration of silica keeps rising over time, the water will eventually become saturated with silica and it will precipitate as chert. In the recent past, chert has generally formed in environments where organisms provide silica. Some sponges, for example, produce skeletons made of silica. You heard that right. Some sponges produce skeletons made of silica. They build these skeletons from a latticework of strand-like filaments. Each piece of the lattice is made of silica and is called a spicule. When a sponge dies, they shed their spicules and the spicules accumulate in soft sediment where they are dissolved. If enough spicules accumulate, the dissolved silica will precipitate as spiculitic chert or spiculite. You can recognize this type of chert under the microscope where you will find strand and filament-like spicules present. That said, sponges aren't the only source of silica or chert. Cherts form in lakes and ocean environments where there is an abundance of radiolarians and diatoms. Both of these groups of microorganisms produce shells made of silica. These organisms spend their lives floating in the surface of a lake or ocean, but when they die, they sink through the water like silicious snow, and then their shells accumulate on the bottom as an ooze like this one. This ooze is a type of biogenous sediment, which can become chert through lithification. Although organisms play a key role in the formation of chert, this may have not always been the case. In the past, it is thought that cherts may have formed in shallow water environments where the evaporation of water causes the concentration of dissolved silica to increase, resulting in the formation of chert. The same process is responsible for the formation of another type of sedimentary rock called evaporite. Evaporite consists of hydrogenous sediment made up of minerals including halite or rock salt along with anhydrite and gypsum. Not surprisingly, given its name, evaporite commonly forms as a result of evaporation of seawater. For this example, we'll focus on halite, or rock salt. Its chemical composition is NaCl, 
sodium chloride. As you know, seawater is naturally salty. It contains high concentrations of sodium and chlorine, along with ions of a variety of other elements. This is true of many lakes and ponds on our planet too. For example, the Great Salt Lake in Utah is notably salty. When these salty waters are environments with high rates of evaporation, such as salt flats like this one, water is lost to the atmosphere. As this happens, the concentrations of sodium and chloride increase until they bond to each other and halite is precipitated from the solution. You can observe this same reaction by dissolving table salt in water and boiling it until the water has evaporated away in the form of steam. Although you will start as a clear solution of salt water, you will eventually find salt grains at the bottom of your container. A final type of biochemical rock worth discussing here is called phosphorite. Phosphorites are an incredibly diverse group of rocks. It sometimes feels like no two phosphorites are exactly the same. That said, all phosphorites do have one thing in common. They all contain high concentrations of calcium phosphate minerals belonging to the apatite mineral family. These are all the minerals that consist of calcium, phosphate, and other elements. In terms of mass, phosphorites are between 5 and 35% calcium phosphate. The rest of the rock may be siliciclastic material, calcium carbonate, or even chert. It depends on the phosphorite. Overall, Phosphorites are rare and hard to identify. Nonetheless, they are an incredibly important natural resource. As you may know, phosphorus is sometimes called a limiting nutrient. The amount of phosphorus partly determines the scale and pace of growth in life within an environment. Why is this the case? Phosphorus is a key component in the phospholipids that make up the membranes that surround all cells of all life forms on Earth. Not to mention, phosphorus is a critical component in the backbone of DNA. Everything alive on our world needs phosphorus and a lot of it. The best places to mine phosphorus are phosphorites, where the phosphorus is present as phosphate and apatite minerals. For this reason, you can find active mines and phosphorites around the world. Phosphorite mining is a very active area of industry. The vast majority of phosphorite that is mined goes to producing fertilizer and animal feed supplements that help to overcome the natural limitations of life. With this in mind, phosphorites may ultimately emerge as one of the most important natural resources in the future, as the task of farmers to grow enough food to feed everyone is becoming increasingly difficult, with population sizes rapidly increasing in countries all around the world. If one thing is clear, an understanding of biochemical rocks and how they form is necessary in helping us to take advantage of their value.